this is the garden side of Schönbrunn Palace then, another building for which Fischer von Erlock is mostly responsible. But splendid as it is, it was never to be the grandiose Versailles surpassing mega palace he and the Habsburgs wanted. It was begun during the reign of the Emperor Joseph I and finished during the reign of his niece Maria Theresa. Unlike Versailles, it was not the primary residence of its owners. It was used as a summer residence in the country, but it is now entirely surrounded by the city of Vienna. Even on the scale to which it was modified by circumstances, primarily financial circumstances, it is said to have 1,200 rooms, and it sometimes housed as many as 2,400 people. We'll be back to see more of Schönbrunn in a moment, but here's Maria Theresa herself by the Dutch-born Martin Meitens, considered a painter of no consequence. Before her father Charles VI died in 1740, he had attempted to persuade the imperial electors and other European powers to accept his edict, known as the Pragmatic Sanction, by which, in lieu of a son, his daughter Maria Theresa here was to inherit the Habsburg domain. Varying degrees of assent were given to this, but as we've heard, King Frederick the Great of Prussia said he would not recognize her unless she surrendered Silesia to him. She wouldn't, and this started the War of the Austrian Succession, in which Frederick and the French supported the claims of her rival, the Suadizan Emperor Charles VII, the Duke of Bavaria, while the English supported Maria Theresa. Here you can see an anonymous portrait of Maria Theresa with her husband Francis of Lorraine on the left and an assortment of their 16 children. After Charles VII died, Francis was crowned Holy Roman Emperor with the approval of Frederick the Great in 1745, and by the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle in 1748, Prussia acquired Silesia. Some other minor territories were involved in the negotiations, which also include the French and the English, but the Habsburgs' loss of Silesia was by far the most significant property transaction. And Maria Theresa's desire to get it back was to be one of the main causes of the Seven Years' War that began in 1756. Although Francis was nominally the emperor, everyone knew that Maria Theresa made the decisions, even to preventing him from fighting with the army lest he be hurt. He is said to have reluctantly acquiesced in this, but this added to the general view that he was not possessed of much leadership ability. It's hard to imagine Frederick the Great staying home because his wife didn't want him to command troops. In this picture at Schönbrunn by a fellow named Batoni, we see two of Maria Theresa's sons, Joseph on the right, who became the nominal emperor in 1765 when Francis died, and Leopold on the left, who will take over in 1790 on the death of his brother who had no sons. Maria Theresa is usually represented as a benevolent despot with the character of a kind of stern grandmother. But Joseph II espoused all sorts of liberal causes that worried her to no end, and she found that a son could be much more difficult to control than a husband. Joseph corresponded with Voltaire and even had dinner with Frederick the Great himself, who shared many of his philosophical ideas, even if they were political enemies. After Maria Theresa's death, Joseph issued the Edict of Toleration, which gave Protestants essentially equal rights with Catholics and also made life much easier for the Jews as well. He essentially abolished serfdom and greatly increased freedom of the press, although he did reimpose some restrictions on the latter when he felt his policies were being abused. This is a view of the entrance to Schönbrunn now, painted by Bellotto in 1759, and we're going to see some more of Schönbrunn while we hear part of Haydn's Symphony No. 48. In 1772, Maria Theresa visited the Esterhazys at Eisenstadt, and Haydn wrote this to be performed in honor of the occasion, so it's known as the Maria Theresa Symphony. <laughs> ¶¶ 
is a photograph of the entrance as it looks today. And this is the Great Hall, sort of Schönbrunn's Rococo equivalent to the Salle de Glace at Versailles. And this is the theater at Schönbrunn. The Gobelin Room, so-called because of the tapestries. The Chinese Room. And the so-called Million Dollar Room apparently in reference to the value of the Persian manuscript paintings which were cut up to fit in the exotic Rococo frames on the walls. In this room, you can see the picture of Joseph II and Leopold II, which we saw earlier with a portrait of their father, Francis I, on the left. Here you are back outside now, and this is Bellotto's view of the garden facade. Vienna is at the right, the extreme right in this picture. You can see that there was not much this far west of Vienna, not much due north of Schönbrunn here at the time Bellotto painted his picture. And in this view, you can see how things have changed now. This is a picture by Bellotto of the Aula, or auditorium, of the former Jesuit University of Vienna. It's now owned by the Vienna Academy of Sciences. The last performance of his work Haydn attended took place here in 1809. After Nicholas Esterhazy's death, Haydn made two trips to London in the 1790s, and many think the so-called 12 London symphonies, the last 12 he wrote, are his best work, and we'll hear parts of a couple of them in the future. But he also wrote six birthday masses for the wife of Nicholas II, Esterhazy, as well as two oratorios, The Creation in the Seasons, and many now think that they are even more impressive, these later masses and oratorios, than the symphonies. The masses are certainly among the most powerful such things ever written, and hardly seem suitable for a lady's birthday. We'll hear part of the most famous of these, the so-called Lord Nelson Mass, in the future also. This is the way the Aula looks today, and it was here that Haydn attended a performance of his own music then for the last time. The performance was of the Creation Oratorio, which you're hearing now.
This is the way the auto looks inside today. And in this anonymous painting of the event, we see Haydn being applauded by, among others, Ludwig von Beethoven, the fellow in brown at the lower left, leaning toward Haydn, who is seated. Here now is one of Johann Zoffany's portraits of George III himself, the archetypal red coat. Zoffany was born in Frankfurt, spent a lot of time in Austria and Italy, but is best known for his portraits of English aristocrats and members of the royal family. George III, who succeeded his grandfather George II in 1760, is of course the main villain in the story of the American Revolution, and Louis Cronenberger calls him England's worst modern king. In private life, however, he was a not unappealing character. He was interested in all the arts and made some fine sketches, and as I mentioned earlier, owned 50 canalettos. He wrote on various subjects, especially farming under a pseudonym. He loved music and gave Haydn a pair of stockings embroidered with musical notes and a parrot that could sing, Rule Britannia, by way of trying unsuccessfully to persuade him to stay in England, and he was a devoted husband and father. Samuel Johnson called George III, in fact, the finest gentleman he'd ever met, and this is where Johnson, whom Will Durant calls the strangest figure in English literary history, was born in Litchfield, about a hundred miles or so northwest of London. His father was a bookseller and printer and was able to start Samuel off at Oxford, but money ran out and he had to leave after a year. He did a little teaching and newspaper writing, but in 1735, when he was 26, he married a woman old enough to be his mother, who had enough money to start a school of his own. Despite the disparity in their ages and the suggestion of a mercenary motive for the marriage, he seems to have genuinely loved her and to have remained loyal even after she became an alcoholic and an opium addict. The school was not a success, but it did attract one interesting pupil, David Garrick, who was to become the greatest Shakespearean actor of the day. This is the earliest surviving portrait of Johnson by Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was to become the man we should probably regard as Johnson's best friend. Boswell dedicated his famous biography of Johnson to Reynolds, and there are more references to Reynolds in it than to anyone but Johnson himself. After the school failed, Johnson and his wife and Garrick all went to London, and for the next ten years Johnson made an irregular living as a freelance writer, primarily by contributing biographies and other articles to the Gentleman's Magazine, a kind of literate 18th century equivalent to people which was, in fact, the first magazine to be called a magazine. In 1746, a consortium of booksellers commissioned Johnson to produce a dictionary, and although he wrote all sorts of essays, plays, poems, translations, biographies, a novel, and so on, it's the dictionary which most people now think of first in connection with his name. This is the building on Gough Square in London where Johnson lived while working on the dictionary and it doubled as office for him. Today it's a museum devoted to his memory. There had been English dictionaries of various sorts published before Johnson's effort. Simon Winchester calls Robert Caudry's table alphabetical of hard unusual English words intended primarily for women and other unskilled persons which was published in 1604, 
the first true English dictionary, and Nathaniel Bailey's Universal Etymological Dictionary, published in 1721, defined 38,000 words, but neither these nor any of the other earlier efforts achieved the general presence and scholarly authority that came to be associated with Johnson's great Dictionary of the English Language, published in 1755. Until the 18th century, there were also no generally accepted books on English grammar either. Robert Loth's short introduction to English grammar, published in 1762, was the first, and it was still in use in some schools until the early 20th century. Until the 18th century, the general assumption was that Latin was the language of scholarship, and while one needed to know the proper rules for writing that language, English, the vernacular, was free to develop as it would. This is one of the rooms in the Gough Square house. Johnson emphasized in the preface to the dictionary that he was not trying to, as he put it, embalm the language and preserve it from dis supposed decay. This he thought was a vain hope. With this hope, however, he continued, academies have been instituted to guard the avenues of their languages, to repulse intruders, but their vigilance and activity have hitherto been in vain. Sounds, Johnson goes on to say, are too volatile for legal restraints. To enchain syllables and to lash the wind are equally the under undertakings of pride, unwilling to measure its desire by its strength. These comments were made with the French Academy specifically in mind, the purpose of which in its dictionary has always been more prescriptive than descriptive. Even today, all dictionaries and grammars do have, of course, a sort of built-in conservative and prescriptive character, which isn't necessarily all bad. Obviously, if communication is to go on from one generation to the next, a certain continuity of meaning has to be maintained, but pervasive changes in usage have to be recognized. As Winston Churchill says, there are some rules of grammar up with which I will not put. This is called the Dictionary Room in the Gough Square House. Johnson's friend Garrick said of his work on the dictionary, and thinking of the forty immortals as they are called of the French Academy, there's Johnson well armed like a hero of yore, he beat forty French and he could beat forty more. Johnson did have seven clerks to assist him, but most of the scholarly work, including the actual writing of the forty thousand definitions he did himself, In accordance with his view that dictionaries should be descriptive rather than prescriptive, he used quotations, 114,000 altogether, to support his definitions, and gathering these was the most arduous and time-consuming part of the project. The editors of the Oxford English Dictionary have followed this precedent in their work, of course, and have included a million and a half quotations to support the definitions of 500,000 words in the latest edition. English dictionaries are typically larger than dictionaries of other languages because English has fewer homographs. On the whole, the older the language, the more homographs it has. That is, the more words it has, the meanings of which are determined by context, like B-O-W, for example. By itself, we don't know whether that refers to a decoration in a girl's hair, the front of a ship, or something to shoot an arrow with. Latin and Greek have many more such words. There's a famous Latin sentence that goes mallow, 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 each of the homographs having a different meaning. This is another room in Johnson's house which displays some of the books he consulted for quotations in the cabinet. This lack of homographs makes English a simpler language in some ways, as does its streamlined grammar. Again, surprisingly, as a general rule, the older the language, the more complex the grammar. The inconsistencies of English pronunciation may be a little hard for some foreigners, but the relative unimportance of things like grammatical gender and noun declension make it a much easier language to learn to read and write than most other European languages.
This was Johnson's biographer Boswell's favorite portrait among the dozen or so which Joshua Reynolds painted. One of the most memorable things about Johnson's dictionary is, of course, the nature of the definitions themselves, many of which reflect Johnson's own character. The most famous is perhaps the definition of the oat, which he defines as a grain that in England is fed to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. This definition was well answered by someone, though, who remarked that that was why England produced good horses and Scotland produced good people. Johnson claimed a dislike to Scott, certainly, but several of his assistants were from Scotland, as was Boswell himself. He also said that France was worse than Scotland for everything but climate, and that the Irish are an honest people, they never speak well of one another. He defined net as a thing decussated and reticulated with interstices between the intersections, which I think he must himself have realized was not very helpful. The word lexicographer is defined as a word referring to a writer of dictionaries, a harmless drudge. The Cheshire Cheese, which is right across Gough Square from Johnson's house, claims to have been in business there since before his time, so I imagine he spent some time in it, although it isn't mentioned by Boswell. Nothing has been contrived by man, says Johnson, which supplies as much pleasure as a good tavern. His wife died while he was working on the dictionary, however, and he said then that while marriage had many pains, celibacy had no pleasures, although he also said that a man who marries a second time illustrates the triumph of hope over experience, and he never did remarry. He lived for about two years in the Staple Inn on High Holborn, which is one of the few Elizabethan-era secular buildings to survive in London. In 1765, he was given an honorary Magister Artium degree and eventually a doctorate from his would-be alma mater, Oxford, not for the dictionary so much as for the 200 Rambler essays, which he also wrote while working on the dictionary, and which many consider to be his greatest accomplishments as a belletrist, but he was no tender-minded aesthete and often spoke with humorous contempt of artistic accomplishments of one kind or another. No man but a blockhead ever wrote except for money is probably his most famous comment along these lines, but he also damned music with faint praise as the least disagreeable of all noises and defined opera as a strange, irrational form of musical entertainment. This is the courtyard of the Staple Inn, where Johnson lived at number two, occupied by a law office now. Once when he was coming out of a performance by a famous violinist, he was accosted by a blue stocking who gushed, Oh, Dr. Johnson, wasn't that an incredible performance? To which he answered, Incredible, yes, madam, but I wish it had been impossible. This is where he was living when he wrote Rasselas, and he also met Oliver Goldsmith here and got the Vicar of Wakefield published for him. After moving from here, he lived much of the rest of his life with friends in the suburbs. This is a portrait of James Boswell. In his biography of Johnson, Boswell comes across as the consummate scholar and his work is always considered a masterpiece of its genre. But according to most accounts, Boswell himself was almost constantly drunk and disorderly, or seeking to be so. He was a born journalist in any case, and loved meeting famous people and seeing interesting and celebrated things and places, and he loved describing them. He was in his 20s when he met Johnson, by then in his mid-50s, at Tom Davies' bookstore on Russell Street in London in 1763. This is what that location looks like today. Boswell was talking to Davies one day here when the latter pointed out Johnson approaching the store. Boswell asked him for an introduction, but not to tell Johnson he was from Scotland. But when Johnson came in, Davies roguishly told him he wanted to introduce a friend of his, James Boswell from Scotland. <laughs> 
Johnson raised his eyebrows, and Boswell admitted he was indeed a Scot, but couldn't help it. To which Johnson replied that he'd done the right thing in coming to London, because the road to London, the road to England, is the finest sight a Scot ever sees. Boswell didn't really see much of Johnson until after 1772, however, and didn't begin writing his biography until after Johnson died, and it was mostly based on interviews with others and documents rather than first-hand experience with the subject, although his account of a three-month journal of a tour to the Hebrides with Johnson is a first-hand documentary. This is the George Inn in Southwark, which is another ancient tavern which may well have been frequented by Johnson when he was living nearby. Boswell doesn't mention it, although he does mention the anchor, which was close to it. In 1764, the famous literary club was formed, which had as members almost all the great writers of the age in England, including Johnson and Boswell, Edward Gibbon, Richard Brinsley Sheridan, Edmund Burke, Adam Smith, Oliver Goldsmith, as well as David Garrick and George John Spencer, and the president was none other than Joshua Reynolds, known, of course, more as a painter than as a writer, but who was regarded by his contemporaries as the greatest living writer on art as well. This is where the Turk's Head Tavern used to be on Gerard Street, which is now in the heart of London's Chinatown. It's hard to imagine what Johnson's reaction to this would be. Burke himself also lived on this street, as had Dryden in the 17th century. Meetings of this group must have produced a lot of memorable encounters. Garrick once told Goldsmith he could write like an angel but talk like a parrot. Boswell called Gibbon a vile, ugly, disgusting fellow. One night, Sheridan and Johnson had a drinking contest in which the former downed 24 glasses of claret, which Johnson surpassed with 32 glasses of port. This is an engraving by William Hogarth called Modern Conversation, which might well have been inspired by a meeting of the club, I think. Sheridan said that a bumper of liquor will end a contest quicker than judge, police, or vicar. And Goldsmith said, let schoolmasters bother their brains with grammar and nonsense and learning. Good liquor, I'll stoutly maintain, gives genius a better discerning. But the sober historian Gibbon complained that too often this all degenerated into crowds without company and dissipation without pleasure. This is another portrait of Johnson by Reynolds. Johnson and Smith had a running battle about British policy regarding the American colonies, Smith arguing that they should be freed, while Johnson once responded, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps about liberty from those who enslave Negroes? I am, he said, willing to love all mankind except Americans. Despite remarks like that, he was invited to go on a speaking tour in the States, but declined because he hated ships. Being on a ship, he said, is like being in jail, only the company isn't as good, the food isn't as good, and one's in danger of being drowned. One of Johnson's closest friends was, in fact, his black servant, Francis Barber, whom he treated more as a son than as an employee, and who was made his heir in his will. This is a portrait by his fellow club member, Reynolds, of Oliver Goldsmith, the author, as I mentioned earlier, of The Vicar of Wakefield, and also of She Stoops to Conquer, the initial success of which was, again, at least partly due to Johnson's support, it's widely considered the greatest play of the age, but no less a judge than Lord Byron was in favor of giving that honor to Sheridan's play, The Rivals. This is a portrait of Sheridan, who was married to the great beauty of the age, Elizabeth Ann Linley, whom we'll see next week in Gainsborough's famous portrait, and we'll also hear more about Sheridan himself then. The Rivals, written when Sheridan was only about 25, has one of the most famous characters in English comedy in it, the notorious Mrs. Malaprop, who says things like, he was as headstrong as an allegory on the banks of the Nile. And, alliterate that man from your memory, alliterate him. <laughs> 
and he is the pineapple of politeness. The school for scandal was an even greater theatrical success, and this enabled him to buy enough votes to get elected to the House of Commons. This is Bow Street in London as it looks today, a street on which a lot of important authors have lived, including William Wycherley, Gibbon, Charles Sackville, and Henry Fielding, who lived where the Fielding Hotel is. Fielding died before the formation of the Literary Club, but Johnson didn't like him, so he probably wouldn't have been let in. His masterpiece, Tom Jones, is often regarded as the greatest English novel, but Johnson thought it immoral, and he also didn't like the way Fielding had made fun of Samuel Richardson's sentimental novel, Pamela. Richardson was a good friend of Johnson's. It may be that there was no Chaucer or Shakespeare or Milton in 18th century English literature, but Fielding, as I said, wrote perhaps the greatest English novel in that century. Gibbon wrote the greatest English history. Boswell wrote the greatest biography, and Johnson himself is the man Harold Bloom calls the canonical critic. And Sheridan in the 18th century certainly was one of the greatest English playwrights. And when you consider that Handel and to some extent Haydn, not to mention people like Thomas Arne and Avison, were writing the greatest music ever written in England in this century, and Gainsborough and Reynolds, arguably the greatest English painters, were 18th century painters. When you consider all this, one can easily make a case that the 18th century, which Kenneth Clark calls the winner of the imagination, was in fact the greatest in the history of imagination and creativity in England. This is the modest monument to Johnson next to St. Clement Danes, which was his favorite church. Once when Boswell suggested to Johnson that his argumentative personality put people off, Johnson responded, what's wrong with argument? What's wrong with contradiction? Boswell replied, it's the manner in which you do it, sir, roughly and harshly. It upsets people with weak nerves. I don't know any people with weak nerves, said Johnson. And Boswell admits that a man has a good chance of getting into heaven if his worst crime is having been a little rough in conversation. He's buried in Westminster Abbey. This is a bust now of William Hogarth on Leicester Square where he lived, uh, another part of London where a lot of famous people have lived, including Isaac Newton and Joshua Reynolds. That's a statue of Shakespeare in the center. Hogarth is now regarded as the first significant English-born painter, although his contemporaries did have mixed feelings about him because of the fact that his subject matter didn't always seem worthy of a real artiste, and he also often made fun of the very clientele on which he had to depend to make a living. This is a self-portrait with his dog Trump. Johnson met Hogarth for the first time in a funny episode at the home of their mutual friend, the novelist Samuel Richardson. Hogarth came into a room in which a fellow was gesturing and talking loudly with no one else around, and Hogarth took him for some lunatic relative of Richardson's until he was introduced to him as none other than Samuel Johnson. This is a platter engraved by Hogarth when he was apprenticed in his teens to a silversmith and although he always considered himself a painter, he really made more money from the sale of his woodcuts and engravings of the paintings he did than from the paintings themselves. He was, in fact, largely responsible for what was called Hogarth's Law, one of the first pieces of copyright legislation to attempt to protect artists from copyists. <laughs> The Rake's Progress, which he painted in 1735, is probably his best known painting. It was part of a series of eight pictures depicting the career of his anti-hero Tom Rakewell, who squandered his inheritance, then married a rich widow and squandered all of her money as well on entertainment like this. If you're looking for influences on him, it would seem that Dutch painters like Jan Steen would come first to mind, but Hogarth's attitude to his subject was very different. Steen was an entertainer. Whereas Hogarth meant his work to carry a moral message, although his pictures are in fact so entertaining, 
that the moral message is usually completely lost. I doubt anyone was ever convinced not to squander his money by Hogarth's pictures. They make money squandering look like too much fun. He was a failure as a moralist, but a great success as a storyteller and caricaturist. One of his most popular series of engravings is called Industry and Idleness, and here we see Francis Goodchild, the industrious apprentice, taking the boss's daughter to church. Where is Tom Idle, the idle apprentice, his opposite? Out in the churchyard shooting craps on a coffin. So Francis the Industrious marries the boss's daughter, and on Christmas Eve they distribute charity to the poor. Where's Tom Idle, the idle apprentice, on Christmas Eve? In bed with a common prostitute, counting up the day's loot he's gotten from picking pockets. Touches like the cat falling down the chimney seem to me to indicate that Hogarth, for all his moral intent, was a humorist at heart. So how does the story turn out? Mr. Goodchild is now a judge, and Tom, his old fellow apprentice, who went over to the dark side, is brought before him on a capital charge, and alas, he must sentence him to be hanged at Tyburn. I think Hogarth can be called the first important English cartoonist, perhaps, or even the inventor of the comic strip in the serialized approach he took to art as the illustration of a story. His masterpiece in this genre is the series of pictures called Marriage a la Mode in the London National Gallery. Here in the first of the series, we see old Lord Squanderfield at the right making arrangements for the marriage of his son, the fop at the left, to the daughter of a wealthy merchant to whom much attention is already being shown by a lawyer named Silvertongue. And while we see these pictures, we'll hear a Sinfonia Concertante by Johann Christian Bach, often called the English or the London Bach. He spent about 30 years of his life in England. He was the youngest of Johann Sebastian Bach's sons to survive him. In this scene, the new Lord and Lady Squanderfield have been partying all night and their financial planner is leaving stage left. Here we see the lady entertaining a group of dilettantes, among whom is to be found the solicitous silver tongue at the right. Meanwhile, Lord Squanderfield is visiting an eminent member of the medical profession with two of his mistresses to find out which has given him a disease. He returns home to find his wife in bed with Silvertongue, who runs him through and jumps out the window. Feeling that she is the cause of this mess, she gets poison from a servant who's being punched in the jaw by her brother. As she dies, her father carefully removes the wedding ring so that can be reused, and the dog takes the opportunity provided by the distraction to gobble up the dinner. <laughs> Hogarth is also the first great English portrait painter, and some call this the finest English portrait ever painted. The subject is Thomas Coram, who was certainly one of the finest portrait subjects ever painted. He was a wealthy ship owner who spent all his money on an orphanage, and then had to be himself supported by his friends. Not many of us 
are generous enough or have generous enough friends to pull that off. Hogarth himself and Handel were among those who contributed to the maintenance of the orphanage, which still exists after a fashion. Hogarth's shrimp girl here in the London National Gallery is perhaps not actually a portrait, but it has always been one of the most popular pictures in the whole gallery, and Louis Cronenberger says it's worth all of his didactic paintings. Okay, that's where we'll wind up this program. Next time we'll see the work of Gainsborough and Reynolds, many examples of which are still on the walls of the stately homes of 18th century England, for whose owners they were originally painted, and we'll also hear about Mozart, among other people and things. Oh, 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 oh,